Hi, Simon, and welcome to the Recruitment Marketing and Sales Podcast. It's great to have you. It's, it's wonderful to be here, Sharon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Now, for those of perhaps people who, who don't know you, Simon Bliss is currently the chairman of TEAM, and I'm going to let you share a little bit more about that. Um, and, and also, if I can invite you to kick us off, Simon, with a, with a little bit about your background into recruitment, because it's a little bit different from most stories of how people have fallen into recruitment. But maybe, you know, I think I thought it'd be great to have you on today's podcast to just learn from your experience of, I, I guess, building a recruitment company, obviously selling and and selling one and what you are doing now, but there's lots of wisdom, um, I think that we can kind of like, you know, pull out of your own journey because you know, you had a business journey before you got into your recruitment company. So can yeah. I maybe just invite to just give a potted history of Simon Bliss? Sure. sure. Um, well, at, at the tender age of 22, I started my motorcycle career business. Um, I met a guy who was, I was an ad manager and he inspired me and I thought that's what I want to do. Um, he was so young, he was about 23, 24 and he was running his own business and I'd never met anyone that young. So a wow. year later, when I was 22, I started mine and then for 28 years that developed and grew and we had, we had a pretty successful business and parcel distribution company. We employed about 500 people. We were national. And it was it was it was like herding cats, but in in all sorts of directions. It wasn't particularly yeah. profitable. Uh, we sold out to a PLC in the end, and I joined them in the, with the fascinating uh, job title of acquisitions director. But um, it was I was I was glad to get out of it. To be fair, I stuck with them for two I years. I imagine it was. I think it was unusual. Uh, firstly, I yeah. think I'm unemployable. For for it for for another employer, so I was glad to get out from. They were pro I think they were glad to get rid of me. So I I I let yeah I was I was then fifty plus and and um and I'd been my own man for twenty since I was twenty two. So it was a difficult journey for me to listen to um, sit around the boardroom table of a PLC, which wasn't run yeah. particularly well. And two years after I resigned, they went bust, which was frightening anyway um, wow. so i got into recruitment at the tender age of 54 by default really uh, that's when most people are trying to get out of recruitment i think but um i bought a recruitment company that was struggling it was it was financially mm -hmm. unstable uh, it was it was a specialist business which i was really interested in or anyone i ever knew that worked in recruitment said work in specialism and they were a health and yeah. safety recruiter principal people uh, based in Chertsey, Surrey had 15 staff. Um, we were losing money uh, on day one, so I had to let six go fairly quickly. And right. we battled on for a couple of years. Um, this is post-2008, so it was 2010 when I bought the business. And right. I didn't get recruitment. That was the wonderful thing. I'd never been in recruitment. I bought a company that was losing money. That, that There were several, several elements there that, uh, that pinpoint what not to do when you're when you run a recruitment business. So I was just going to say quite an alarm bell ringing, you well, know, buying a company that, that's kind of like losing money. Well, I had, I had, um, I had the ambition that I, and, and the ego to think, well, I've run a much bigger company. I can turn this around, but recruitment is different mm. and it's challenging. And um, I, the luck, you know what happens sometimes in your life? Luck comes along. And I, I went to a networking group. I met a girl that um, was a member of team. And she, I told her my story. And when she stopped laughing, she said, you should join team. And I went to a, a regional meeting. Um, I liked what I saw. I joined team. I sort of got embedded quit fairly quickly with, with some of the regional meetings and some of the suppliers. And I found a supplier who I really loved. And um, I got him to come down to our offices uh, a day a month for three months and do a full day's training with this with the staff. 
and and I sat in as well. And at month three, mm. the penny dropped for me. I got this. I thought I've got this. And I looked at right. the staff and they were all looking a bit puzzled and bewildered. And I had recruited one new member who who was ref, a, a referral from a friend. Uh, it was his nephew. He had he had a spark about him. And right. uh, he'd been in tech recruitment for nine months, but hated it. Um, and right. I got, I'd got him to work with me. And, well, the culmination of having the trainer in for three months, I looked to the rest of the staff and I, I just let them all go. So we had we had Josh, me and an office manager, lovely Sue, who stayed with me till the end. And we started again. And um, which leads me on, I think, to what we did next, because I think having learned the the key principles of, of the process, um, it was quite easy to look for the right type of people to plug in and look, nurture and train them. And, and I went for youngsters primarily who had something about them. Um, right. And later, <clears throat> when we started to use this profiling system, we sort of got the hang of looking for people that would fit not necessarily our culture because that that was evolving but would fit um the job requirement whether they be we would do 180 uh recruitment so we'd have resources and business consultants BD, and yeah. that was a model yeah. that really worked fantastic for us but i i think right. to start with what i wanted i had a vision for the business to grow it um and and sell it um uh, for a significant, hopefully as much as I possibly could, but to take some of the key people with me on that journey and share that, you know, for me, it's not, it's not that I I need to don't need to own all the cake. It was, it was, yeah. if you make the cake big enough, everyone can have a slice, and that, yeah, that was absolutely fab in that journey, and and jumping forward seven years later, we had forty in the team, um, uh, and we were dominating that health and safety market in the uk okay. then um mm. a team a team um supplier came to, along to me at one of our conferences and said simon um are you interested in selling and i it was cameron lang and i said cameron yeah i said why did you ask me he said you, where you look you've got gray hair you look old he said you're my target audience uh for recruiters that want to sell and um when I'd forgiven him, um, he introduced me. He'd already had a, a buyer in mind from Denmark who was keen to get into the UK market. And two years later, we completed a deal after an earn out and um, I exited. So, but I think the journey is important. You know, if you, if we're trying to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not the Oracle for how to build a, a recruitment business, but if I can share what I did, some people might be able to take something from that and make it their own. That I always Absolutely. had a vision think, about what I want to do with can the business. I, can I just pause you one second? Because that, you know, that that decision, when the penny dropped and you looked around the room, that decision to, you know, let that team go and to start from scratch, I mean, that is a hugely courageous thing to do. I mean, how did you find that just making that decision to just go from you know like a company well, almost back to a startup again yeah well the firstly th those people have been in recruitment some years before i took over the company their job mm -hmm. was to um their job was to develop relationships with clients and win new business and and at the time, complete that business because we'd, we'd actually got rid of loads of resources. I wanted the consultants to stay. But they weren't getting the business right. in. They weren't doing the front bit. And I think right. what happened in the noughties, if we talk about 2000 to 2010 or 2008, really, mm. health and safety went mad in the UK. I mean, the tabloids were having a field day with it, weren't they? But everyone was yeah. into health and safety. You must do this. You mustn't do that. And... Mm -hmm. the the any any recruit any a recruitment business that specialize in health and safety the phone never stopped ringing and so right. in 2008 when the phone stopped ringing 
when it rang, it weighed half an ounce. When when it wasn't ringing, it weighed ten kilos. Does that does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. They yeah. Just, they'd lost. They'd lost the muscle memory to win new business. And right. I gave him two years to do that and nothing happened. Mm. And no. the, the one piece of the, the one guy that I had that were, had fire in his belly um, was Josh. And um, yeah, he stayed with me to the end. He, he became my number two, yeah. my director and um, with several mm. others around had five brilliant um, team leader managers that uh, stayed till the very end. They all, most of them started um, without any. Uh, Tom was the only one that had any recruitment experience, but the rest of them wow. were um, estate agents and just people that were really good people persons, and um, they were yeah. fabulous. And uh, we and it, and it sounds a, like you really you uh, recruited on on attitude and and trained people uh, completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I take attitude yeah. over ability, or, or yeah, you know, knowledge of the sector to sector. because you can teach people that you know that was that was yeah, a wonderful no, thing. A, a, absolutely. Um, but I mean, so. I, but you go on. Sorry, we needed a vision, though. You know, when they when we were interviewing those people, I mean, the we, I was I was mindful that they were interviewing us as well, and and we certainly yeah. had some amazing young people come into the office to apply for our jobs. And I was absolutely, you know, when we saw someone that was amazing, that had something about them, the one thing we wanted was for them to see something in us that we were going to take them on a journey. Yeah. We were really going to develop their career. And we started pretty early on having personal development plans to go, yeah, you're going to join as a resourcer, but you can take that journey and be an account manager or you could become a consultant and then Mm -hmm. We're looking for team leaders. We've got ambition to grow this business, so we'll help you with management training, and and that was continual. So we, the the, th the three things I outsourced were, um, well, or two things I I certainly outsourced legal. <laughs> we certainly That's outsourced that. training and development. We had we had a wonderful yeah. trainer, and we outsourced marketing. You know, you've got you've you've got mm -hmm. to have a a vision. You've got to have something that reflects that vision. And that, yeah. that mission to grow the business, and mm. some, it, it, not many people have those skills um, all under no. one roof. So you know we yeah. were busy enough yeah. without having to worry about that. Yeah. So to give clarity to our message with our clients was absolutely yeah. clear, and so we we yeah. we we did that as well. And and so in terms of kind of like building, then almost like from the ground back up, you got to forty consultants. What were I guess what what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced on that journey? Me. Um, yeah, that that's a that's a good question. Um, it we made some mistakes on hiring, but you mm. know it, everybody always does. Um, the yeah. one thing I did learn is you'll you if you'll know within three months. Don't don't right. Don't do that. Oh, I'll give them another bit long. It never works. Yeah. And, if if we sort of had a program that if if within three months the individual wasn't developing, wasn't growing, wasn't um, contributing some revenue, then they were probably in the wrong job. And actually keeping right. them on was not good for us. It certainly wasn't good for them. So good it was a mutually <laughs> beneficial thing that we said, look, guys, you may not mm. last here. This is different here. We, we were on a mission. We want to grow fast. We're going to create some fantastic opportunities for career journey, but it might not be for you. You know, it's a bit noisy. Yeah. It's a bit challenging. We're driving people. Mm -hmm. It was. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't. You know, it it it, it wasn't like. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, those terrible films that keep reflecting what it was like to work in a boiler room. Boiler room was one of them, but it was. Oh, boy, it was, yeah, yeah. It was certainly high energy and, and, and it wasn't for everyone's yeah. taste. And so we said it may not, if in, th if in three months you're not happy, we're not happy, let's shake hands and do that. Mm. So we were letting people know from the word go what our expectations are. And that, yeah. that sort of, actually a lot of people said from the word go at interview level, that's not for me. And that right. we, we swerved a bullet there and so did they. 
Mm. It's not working for an individual, then yeah. you've got to let them go and find their find their path. Because uh, so yeah. it was quite easy letting people go if it didn't work. And then mm. we then we got into disc profiling, and we found that certain disc profiles were fantastic. All the team leaders had the same profile, same as me and right. and Josh. And then some of the best resources in the country would have a completely different profile. Their attention to detail was so much better and their qualification of candidates, the the peeling back of the onion, I would call it, when they're yeah. trying to, you know, when candidates would tell you, what's your, re-, you know, we ask them a question, what, why do you want to change jobs? I'm looking for progression. Well, if you ask a candidate, a progression might mean a hundred different things. So you need to build up another yeah. layer and go, what do, mm. what do you mean by that? You know, just explain to me. Yeah. And so the secondary questioning by some of our amazing resources just found the gems that were within so, some of those potential candidates, and we, we were able to nurture and develop some of those. So, yeah, we made some bad hires. Um, yeah. And, and and we made some mistakes in, in some of the markets, you know, Um but the mm. health and safety was a lovely market to be in because we 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 place people in accountants through to zoos, literally A to Z, because everyone needs. Oh, wow. If you were a big enough business, you know, if you had a thousand staff, you needed a health and safety person, even if you yeah. had an accountancy practice. Um, mm. Obviously, that construction, heavy manufacturing has lots of health and safety people, but some of those other businesses mm. needed it as well. So we, it was you know, yeah. it was. And we started to work globally. It was it became really exciting then because we were filling global heads. We started a search division and that was that was really exciting because we were dealing with people who were looking after the big businesses globally. And they would require, mm. we've helped me in the UK. What can you do for me in Kuala Lumpur or Germany or New York? And and that was exciting for my for my staff as well, because it started to stretch yeah. them in terms of not necessarily geography, because we didn't open anywhere else. We just fulfilled. Um, but it so was, that was kind of like like an almost organic growth through UK clients, then bringing you into other subsidiaries that that they had. Yeah, and and yeah, you know, a, a, the a rather unusual thing is that health and safety in the UK was probably better developed than most other countries globally. The the standards right. that 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 gov uk gov put the health and safety yeah. directive put on put on the uk was higher than lots of other um standards elsewhere in the world and so right big companies were looking for uk health and safety leaders to run their mm. global businesses so that that sort of fell in our favor really yeah um, and i mean as, as you were going on this kind of real accelerated um sort of like growth program let's say i mean what were some of the big lessons there as you were you were kind of like, you know pushing? I mean, some people, you know, it, it wouldn't have been for them, so they would have kind of like left. You know, some probably wouldn't have cut it. But what were some of the other lessons that, that you got from this journey? We we um one of the things we wanted we I, I bought a business which is one hundred percent perm, and right I, I it was actually networking with a few team members that made me think about significantly think about moving to moving the business into contract as well. And, and then right. later I did search and selection at the senior level. So I wanted to develop right. and that was hard, you know, um, mm. we'd never done it. I bought the business I bought was 26 years old. So it, it was well established as a brand, but yeah. it, it had only ever done per. And so, Right. Quite a few of our competitors were way ahead of us, and we but that mm. was a hard graph. But we found we found a young man fresh out of Kingston University. I called it the Red Brick University, and it, it's made of red brick and and, and right. quite a bit more concrete. Um, and he was he he took to it like a duck to water, and in the end, he became he he headed up that division of the business and made That's it his up. own, and 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 he. And we, so we we then had to try and look for people who moved at a slightly different pace, and were more suited mm. to contract than perm. 
and a few yeah we moved a few of our perm people into contract that didn't work so we moved them back again right. so we right. we had to identify a new avatar that would work contract and and that was a tricky for a while mm. but it, in the mm. end it worked and you know it it, it probably got me a a, a, a multiple of a, a couple of a couple of digits more for the business than I would have done on the earnout than yeah. than had we just yeah. had a perm business, so that yeah. that was that was key, um, and it I mean, was what, what... go on sorry go ahead, just go ahead and then I'll come back. Yeah, we we then saw one of the biggest areas that we were quite successful in was in social housing, and so we we were doing health and safety stuff and in social housing. And no surprise with Grenville Tower, you needed fire risk assessors as well everywhere. So we did quite a lot yeah. of fire risk. And our social housing clients, where we were pretty successful, started to ask us to say, can you find a facilities manager or we need a quant quantity surveyor? And we thought, there's a market here. So we did a bit of digging. I was going to say, this is starting to spread yeah. out a little bit more. Yeah. And just to put you in the picture, there was, there's, there's about... 10,000 companies in the country that use health and safety people. And some of them might have right. one and some like Balfour Beatty would have 300, mm -hmm. but they, mm -hmm. they employed 40,000 health and safety people in the UK. In social housing, there were about a hundred companies doing social housing. So mm -hmm. much smaller community, much smaller, but mm -hmm. they employed 180,000 people. So over four times as many. So the social oh, housing yeah. market in in what I would call specialisms was a much better market. Mm. And, and right. so we segregated that social housing recruitment. We 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 secured the URL for twenty pounds because uh, no one had used it. Socialhousingrecruitment.co.uk. And the guy we we found one of our team leaders who's run with it, and he's now managing director of that division. We've split it. They split it off wow. after I sold it. Yeah. So yeah. it's that that was a that was a sort of sort of light bulb moment to go. We could t make this bigger, and mm. and that probably added a multiple of another one to my um to my earnout because yeah. because it was a market opportunity. Um, yeah. And it we were satisfying and and we were trusted. You know, without being yeah. unkind to social housing businesses, you could. It was easier to embed yourself with those a bit like a um a managed service provider or um, mm, um yeah. so we we'd look after lots of their roles rather than what happens in health and safety is you know less than one percent of the the your the employer the your staff would work in health yeah. and safety so you've there's a thousand company with a thousand staff you know with a manufacturing operation they need a health and safety manager. Mm. You fill that job, they won't talk to you for five years until he or she wants to leave, or or they expand yeah. and they want an assistant. So yeah. the repeat business was tough unless you dealt with the really yeah. big companies like Balfour's. Yeah, and it took yeah. us two years to get even in the door with Balfour BT. Yeah. Um, so so I mean, so thinking that you've got you've got two examples there, I guess, of where you have, you know, it was a perm business you introduced. I guess a couple of different products, let's call them products, you know, contracting, yeah. um, an exec search, and then you've gone to like an, an aligned market. Yeah. So you know, think, I guess thinking about companies today, there is an awful lot of conversation around, you know, the risk of relying on contingency, lots of interest and people, you know, getting trained in selling a retained offer mm. and introducing that or making the transition completely so i mean in terms of today's market and where things are heading you know, what would your guidance be to a company that is you know heavily reliant on either temping or perm you know contingency what guidance would you give them if they're wanting to, to build and grow and, and have that goal of, of selling um, I think there's some amazing temp businesses doing business now. I think one of the biggest challenges mm. they've got is cash flow, you know, yeah. um, unless you've got a good support and finance. Um, mm. I don't, you know, cash is 
cash the p- people say cash is king yeah. which is a bit but yeah. at the moment it is because lots mm. of people are holding on to it um yeah and that squeezed quite a lot of smaller temp businesses who mm. are trying to juggle you know so many different plates where the boss mm. is might be the the boss might be the um the main uh revenue earner in the business if it's a small business mm. and he or she's juggling cash and um and credit control and stuff like that that gets left behind mm. but what mm. i i think i think if you've got a specialism really look look at the size of that market you know um mm. and 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 look at how you could maximize the potential within that market so if you're in a specialism you could you go for it properly uh, position mm. yourself well get your branding right your messaging right use some use some uh, proper marketeers uh, to help you position that business properly and look for some USPs within them, you know, the, the, yeah. um, provide some products and services that are uh, offer a broad range to those clients. If you're just doing temp, for goodness sake, do perm. If you're just doing perm, yeah. for goodness sake, do contract or temp as well, yeah. because yeah. you can deal with the same clients and, mm. um, you're mm. just letting somebody else in the door otherwise yeah um yeah and if you're if you are doing perm um then then look at certainly going up the food chain you know if you're dealing at manager level and operator level look try and get up to senior heads pop you know yeah. executive uh level yeah. or even c-suite because those yeah. guys and girls are the they're the hiring managers for the teams so you place mm. a new head of in any in any function what they'll probably mm-hmm. do is look at the team a bit like i did with my old company and say how can we strengthen this you know with yeah. all due respect uh, yeah. let's try and shake you know get the broom out shake it up a little bit let's hire some mm-hmm. people that can really take this business forward so hiring yeah. c-suite is and, and heads of departments are brilliant because they come back to you um yeah to for to build their teams so I think yeah. that, that that's a terrific opportunity. And if yeah. you're doing that, those companies really respect a retained service. They, uh, mm. they they sort of understand it better than what I would say middle management who just want people fast. So yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, if you go up the food chain, guess what? The salaries are higher and automatically Absolutely. your fees are higher. Um, yeah. And and and. If you can, if you can deal with those executive heads or senior heads, then they, they understand the importance of talent and the time yeah. it takes sometimes to find that, to and find good talent, and and also you know paying for that in advance, you know through a retained mm. program of, you mm. know three payments or four. We introduced yeah. a fourth payment um, and nudged that up a little bit. So we were selling right. our executive search and retained at twenty five percent. And for a few clients, we we charged thirty percent, and the final five percent would be after six months of them being onboarding, so that when they when the clients really getting ROI from the individual and they feel really comfortable, they've made the right decision. It was like an insurance policy for them, yeah. um, and and it made us work with the client and the candidate to make sure that onboarding worked properly. Was but well on several yeah. occasions we yeah. were able to squeeze another five percent and. Oh, that I makes, like that. Nice. You know, 5% on yeah. a 100K salary is worth Not to be sniffed adding. at it. It certainly, yeah. it certainly is. Yeah. Now, something that you talked about was, obviously, you you ended up going into the international market through your existing client base. Um, of course, I, it feels like, you know, post-COVID and that whole acceleration of the online world and the breaking down of barriers, it feels like the talent pool is more global now but at the same time so is the potential for how you know recruitment businesses can grow i mean what what are your thoughts on the, the certainly i find in the it market especially mm. um there's you know a huge interest in going into let's say the american market but europe and and america what yeah. what are your thoughts on on that i we well, i we didn't discuss this before but um I think you'll bang on with that idea. We've we're actually mm. running an event in um in October on 
uh, developing your business internationally. And that might be mm. with only a footprint in the UK and then selling internationally, or it might mean for for significant markets like the US, which is, you know, the biggest market in the world, actually mm. going there. And five of our team members are already there already. Um, they're doing some great stuff. Um, additions, SR2, um, uh, Tim Lane's got somebody over there from uh, Park Lane and uh, okay. Sam from Medical Engineers. She's got someone in Canada and looking, she's got business in Dallas. Right. So um, I think there's huge opportunity in, in the States. The, the, firstly, mm. here's the weird thing. We, they, there's the same amount of number of recruitment companies in the UK as there is in the States. And they've got 315 million people. We've got 67 in the UK. I know. And they like it's Brits. Crazy. They like Brits. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, there's uh, the other thing is if you're if you if you're recruiting a and and I'm I'm just picking a a, a programmer for um, mm. that might be that might earn fifty thousand in the UK. That salary mm. in the state could be seventy thousand. And I'm using sterling yeah. as the base. Mm. And but here's the interesting thing: if you get fifteen percent in the UK, you could probably get twenty five percent. In the states for that individual as well, because yeah. they pay more. Yeah. So instead of earning mm. seven and a half thousand sterling for 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 the mm. for the same skill set guy or girl, you can earn seventeen thousand yeah. for yeah. placing that individual in the states. And um, I, I, I use Tim Lane again, Park Lane Recruitment. He did his biggest. He's based in Macclesfield, and um, he did, and he's done his biggest deal in in New York ever. And he's been in recruitment wow. 30 years. And he did that mm. last year. So great yeah. opportunity uh, abroad. On October the 11th, in uh, yeah. uh, Safri Champness, um, our partners, our accountancy partners in London, we're running an event with the Department of uh, Business and Trade who are giving amazing mm -hmm. support to any business, recruitment businesses as well, that are looking to uh, look at foreign markets. They d they'll do market mapping on your on your target sector in any in up to mm -hmm. 170 countries in the world so so if you're interested in america in medical engineers they'll go and market map it mm -hmm. for you for medical engineers if you're looking wow. at specialist technology in germany they'll go and market map it for you free and um it's amazing support they're giving and mm -hmm. thankfully because it's a civil service and i used to work there a thousand years ago they're not very good at marketing themselves, but um, I got introduced to them. Andy Dunn, my, our new MD, and I went to meet them, and they're doing some fantastic work at supporting expanding ambitious businesses that want to sell abroad mm. or move abroad and sell. So we've got a session yeah. with them, and we're getting um, uh, a few guys down from the PGC group who specialize in America um, and, right. and, and recruit setting up setting up your recruitment office in america they're going to give some guidance on that as well so that's now that uh, sounds October the 11th. two great opportunities yeah but two kind of like sort of final questions really um you you kind of like refer to um in terms of growth some of the important things will be about um you know really kind of like niching um positioning messaging coming up with some kind of like, you know, USPs, which, you know, all kind of like is very much sort of marketing and related, um, you know, I guess jargon, isn't it? I mean, for you, what was the importance of the role that marketing played in, I guess, you know, growing the recruitment business, but also how your marketing team, um, and then my last question is going to be about team. So yeah, just yeah. tell me a little bit about from your perspective, the importance of marketing. I, I, I think if, if you've got a clarity on your vision and your mission and where you're going with the business mm -hmm. and if that mm -hmm. and hopefully that the, the culture of that is to support all the communities and stakeholders that you're going to take on that journey. Um, mm -hmm. It's giving real clarity to that so that people buy into it. And and yeah. sometimes business owners, they they've got in their head where they want to go. Sometimes they, they lack the the experience. And I certainly do about how to put that into words with clarity so that everyone gets it. Mm -hmm. And that might be if yeah. you're running a recruitment business or like we are we're with a team network that support recruitment businesses in the UK, mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that there's real clarity in that vision 
and there's tangible benefits attached to that for people aligning themselves with you so that they they buy into yeah. that um and yeah i think you need professionals to do that a bit like learning and development you know what yeah. when i had my clear vision for principal people i knew i needed training and development because god i didn't know i didn't understand recruitment didn't then know what I, you were doing then <laughs> you know what i was doing um right. once once we had the l d kick, ticked off i wanted to you know i i kept pushing the vision the mission with the people and they were running with as fast as they possibly could it was fantastic energy that we get out of the people mm. but then it, it's important that you then communicate that to clients and candidates so they come on the journey with you so yeah. um it i'm well, we needed marketeers to clarify that vision mm. for us and and yeah. really challenge us about what we were trying to do and how we were yeah. trying to communicate to those to those communities because health yeah. and safety people weren't the most easiest people to communicate to they're they're quite process driven and we needed to yeah. find ways to 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 get them to trust us um yeah and and that the, the, our integrity on supporting them in their journey was real and and true and that we would we would you know genuinely be in their best in, we'd be looking after mm -hmm. their best interest to work with us yeah and um that was key and we're still yeah. doing that with team um yes. and i'm really i'm really looking forward to rolling out some we've got a program we're running out uh, rolling out this quarter we've got i've just finished um a, a setup call we're partnering and no surprise we're part we've got a strategic partnership with linkedin that we'll be uh sharing with our team network um in in september and I think they're going to Ooh. join us in our, our London meeting to showcase that. Right. But we're doing a webinar as well to yeah. um, to to show what LinkedIn and, and team can do together to help help our our, our members grow and develop yeah. and impact on their communities. Yeah. And and several other things that we're doing with strategic partners to really push the team message and what we're trying to do to to help people achieve whatever their goals are. You know, mm. a goal for a startup might be to be in business in a year's time and a goal for a solo might be to grow and, and have an empire or to have a wonderful lifestyle business um, that where they pick and choose their clients and their candidates mm. and that that that's all they need from their world. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I know you've got some clients that are solos that have FTSE 100 clients. We won't mention her name, but no she's amazing and, and 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 you know if we want people to achieve their ambitions and be on the top of their game whether it's one yeah. person or a hundred yeah. person business Abs and, absolutely and that, that's that's really our goal for team now yeah we've got to get that message and, and so i mean you've you've mentioned team but for that there are going to be a lot of people potentially listening to this that um are team members and there will be people that don't know much about team. Yeah. So um, maybe, you know, you could just sort of summarize for us, you know, what team is, who is it for, what does it yeah. offer and, and, and how should they get in touch with you, Simon, you know, you or Andy, if they want to learn more about team? Yeah. Um, well, um, team is a community. Um, it, it, we're, we're a business that helps um, small recruitment businesses maximize their potential and i sort of said it mm -hmm. in the previous you know if you're if you're a startup a solo um uh, an established business where the business owner might be the the biggest biller so three mm. four five six seven staff um more lifestyle but there may be specialist or local generalist mm -hmm. or or scale up you know if, if you've got to 10 plus you've probably identified a team leader manager who can help you on your journey and then mm. part of that challenge is identifying the next one so that you can add another block on the system yeah. um, and and we're trying to support all of those all of those avatars probably up to a, a maximum of 75 to 100 you know we've got right hr go and meridian that are 100 plus but they're sort of quirky mm -hmm. different uh they fit into our culture with what they're trying to give back which is fairly unusual and fairly unique with bigger businesses but yeah. Our avatars are those smaller businesses that are starting off, established, mm -hmm. or on a journey to grow 
uh, and we, yeah. we want to help them and encourage them to do that. And, yeah. and we do some rather quirky different things. We run 100 different events a year, which are online and face to face. We connect people um, and we connect them for several reasons. We want them to share their ideas, their challenges under an umbrella of trust and then ultimately mm. share jobs. You know, the, yeah. the REC last year put out a, state, a, a fact that only 33 percent of jobs that are with agencies get filled in the UK market. And that's dreadful. <laughs> you know, it is, yeah. so we we uh, my the previous owner and I've, I've celebrated what he brilliantly did before me for many, many years. He built this umbrella of trust within team for members to work together to share those ideas mm -hmm. and those problems, but also jobs. So yeah. we have team exchange, which is a portal where you if you can't fill a job, you put it on the portal and other people can support you with that and find candidates for you that you might not have. And yeah. millions of pounds worth of uh, revenue get created a year on jobs that wouldn't have been filled. So yeah. team members are happy because they've got revenue from both. And generally, it's 50-50, yeah. but there's a bit of flexibility there. Mm -hmm. The candidates are, are happy because they found a job they wouldn't have been, perhaps Absolutely. got. Absolutely. And the yeah. client is happy. So that if the client's happy, they stick with the job owner, the the the, mm. the agency that had that job yeah. and um it, it's creating uh uh lots of additional revenue and we really want to build on that and i'm yeah. i'm proud to say what we had we had two new members that joined in june meet meet at our conference face to face um uh, on the 16th of june and i i, and I interviewed them uh, a week ago they have filled six jobs together since june and created Fantastic. another nearly twenty thousand pounds worth of revenue, um, yeah. And they paid for their membership for the next twelve years each. Absolutely, it's yeah. fantastic. That is well, brilliant. That is good. Yeah. yeah. That, that, no. So team is about um, working with uh, like-minded individuals, uh, business owners that are open to share um, yeah. ideas, challenges, jobs. So that yeah. in a community that will protect you and support you and yeah. um, and really maximize your potential. And, and also we've got a we've got a, nearly 100 suppliers who will give specialist discounts to mm -hmm. to you as uh, uh, team members for um, mm -hmm. for their products and services. And the biggest one is we buy we co we consolidate through candidate source job board pricing and you can save up to 80 yeah. percent of your price on job boards. I mean, it's phenomenal. Huge. We, we, we had a guy join the other day from Portsmouth. He said, I want to join for job sharing. I said, how much do you spend on job boards? He said, oh, 120000 a year. And we saved him 5500 on his job boards. He said, I didn't even join for this. He <laughs> said, and I've saved 5500 in my first week. So Fantastic. he was over the moon with that. Yeah. So lots, lots of benefits and um a bit of a and, bit of clarity did, from us as to what those benefits are to to the to the recruitment community. Yeah. But we're here. Um, we're at the teamnetwork.co.uk. Come and talk Super. to any of our my wonderful team: uh, uh, Bella, Lauren, Jackie, Andy, or myself, um, yeah. or, or either of the two Rachels uh, who who make Fantastic. up HQ. Yeah, cool. Sharon, I'm well, exhausted. that's brilliant. I'm exhausted. <laughs> There's there's so much can like from all your experience to you know I could just keep pulling more and more lessons from you but I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you so much for your time and sharing, you know some some really valuable insights and and some thoughts as well about you know how businesses can, I guess capitalize on the opportunity that that there is today because I think there is a huge amount of opportunity, yeah. um, you know even in some areas where the markets can be slightly more challenging and. There is a huge amount of um, resource and support available in Team. So I'd really encourage anybody who doesn't know anything about Team, go and check out, um, you know, the website again. Sort of, um, if I remember rightly, Simon, it is the team, team network. .co the team UK. network. I always remember mm. the team network. .co .uk. Yeah. Um, go and check out the website um, and, and pick up the phone and have a conversation with one of the yeah. team because um, it is a great community to be part yeah. of. 
So I will connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll make sure we find the right person to talk to you. Be great. Thank you. That's fantastic. Cheers, Simon. Um, so no doubt you and I will speak soon in the team network. I look forward to it, Sharon. Thank you. You're very welcome. Cheers, Simon. Bye for now.